Previously, we have talked about the kinetics for low conversion condition. Now we are going to talk about uh, kinetics under higher conversion condition, which gives us the so-called JMA equation. Still, let's start with assumptions. Similar as before, we have three basic assumptions. First one, spherical nuclei, which means the nuclei, when they form their sphere in shape, and as they grow, they are growing three-dimensionally into larger spheres. Second one, the beta precipitate nucleation rate is constant of n. A constant nucleation rate means per unit time, per unit volume, a fixed number of new nuclei that are formed, and that number is n. A third assumption is the growth rate of those spherical nuclei is constant. Specifically, the radius grows linearly with respect to time. Our dr over dt is a constant of v. Okay, so these three assumptions are same as what we dealt with before for the low conversion case. However, to deal with higher conversion, we have to consider, read to yourself, overlapping in random nucleation. So when we say random nucleation, we allow the nuclei to form randomly any, anywhere within this host or matrix material. Okay. However, when you think a little bit deeper, something like this, if a nucleus try to occur within this blue so-called transformed volume, if a new nuclei tries to form in this transformed volume, can it happen? No, not really, because it's already transformed. It's already changed from the matrix phase to the precipitated phase. As a result, naturally, it cannot happen. But in our previous treatment, for low conversion, we didn't consider it, we neglect it. But now when we deal with higher conversion, if we allow for random nucleation, then mathematically, random, it may occur here, but in reality, it cannot occur. So these types of nuclei, we would call them phantom nuclei. Phantom nuclei, which means the those nuclei that try to form within transform the volume. It's not real. It, we give it a name called uh, phantom nucleation. With that in mind, let's define F as a volume fraction of real precipitate. F as volume fraction of real precipitate, which is just the ratio between the total volume for transformed volume divided by the total initial volume. F, that gives us the F. And then, the number of real beta precipitate, the number of real beta precipitate formed or nucleated in the small increment time of d tau. When is d tau? It's from tau to tau plus d tau. Okay, within that small time period d tau per unit volume, the newly formed nuclei, the number would be dnr. Again, r is for real nucleation, DNR, the number of real nucleus formed would be time d tau times the n, the nucleation rate, times 1 minus f. This factor of 1 minus f is very, very important. Remember, f is the fraction of transformed volume. So 1 minus f is the so-called untransformed volume, the remaining volume, the remaining untransformed volume, which is the wide portion within this large uh, sphere. Okay, so by time all these three factors together, we get the incremental number of real nucleus formed within time data. And then introduce the concept of extended nucleation. Some textbook you may find that to call this extended nucleation as imaginary nucleation. Okay, 
So extended nucleation or imaginary in nucleation, it's the same. It's the type of nucleation that includes both, read to yourself, real nucleation, things like this, this, and those we call phantom nucleation, something like this. Okay? Phantom nucleation. So the extended nucleation is a theoretical concept that includes both real nucleation and phantom nucleation. Those nucleus that tries to form within existing transformed volume. So we have in introduced this theoretical concept, extended nucleation. Then the number of extended beta precipitate formed in the same small time increment period of d tau would be dn ext, n for number of nucleus formed. ext means for the so-called extended nucleation. The nucleation include both real nuclei and the phantom nuclei real nuclei and phantom nuclei that would be earned the capital and nucleation rate times the incremental time of d tau okay that gives us the so-called extended nucleation that formed within time d tau then we would have the ratio dnr divided by dn ext would be right side divided by right side n and n cancel out, d tau and d tau cancel out. We are left with only the factor of 1 minus f. Okay, again, f is a volume fraction for transformed a real precipitate. And 1 minus f naturally gives us the remaining of the untransformed volume. And that gives us the ratio between real to the extended. Again, extended is the concept that includes both real and the phantom. So this is what we have from previous. The ratio between nr, the number of real nuclei formed within time d tau, to the number of nuclei formed uh, extended nuclei, which include both real and the phantom, equals to the 1 minus f. Again, f is the fraction of transformation, okay? The real transform, real precipitate divided by the total initial volume. With that, now let's consider both real nuclei and extended nuclei, which is the real plus phantom. They would grow from the same initial size. For simplicity, let's assume initial size is zero. And at the same linear rate of V, dr over dt equals V, which is constant radius growth rate. Okay? Because of that, we would have this approximation. dnr over dn ext, the number ratio equals to the incremental volume ratio for the real to the extended. Okay, because they grow from the same initial size of zero size and they grow at the same speed. Then let's introduce another factor, f e x t, f for fraction, extended uh, precipitate volume fraction, which is real, both real and the phantom. That is our extended fraction, and f e x t would be the total volume of extended divided by the initial volume. And let's say we start with unit volume, then that will be ex we extended over one. With that, we would have the ratio between the number of nucleus for real versus extended would be the incremental volume for real divided by incremental volume for extended. And volume would be incremental real fraction divided by incremental extended fraction okay and uh, don't forget the ratio between dnr to dn ext is one minus f so we would have df over df ext equals one minus f again f is the real 
volume uh, real fraction for real precipitate while x f x x t is the fraction for extended precipitate which is real plus phantom okay with this relationship if we rearrange we would get df divided by 1 minus f equals d f e x t we just from here we rearrange and then if we do integration we would have the real fraction f equals 1 minus e to the power of minus f e x t this equation relates the real fraction f and extended fraction and in this case even if extended fraction goes towards infinity the real fraction would be 1 because f e x t is always a positive number okay and the e to the minus the infinite power number becomes zero and one minus zero gives us one okay mathematically at least uh, we know f is a finite number it's what okay so this is what we have now we have an equation that relates the real fraction and the extended fraction when we do not consider overlapping remember extended is for real plus phantom and the phantom is overlapping with real okay remember that extended fraction of conversion is essentially represented by the fraction of conversion in low conversion previously we have derived that without considering any overlapping effect in that case we said Okay, f e x t is 1 over 3, pi n v to the power of 3, t to the power of 4. Okay, again, n is random nucleation rate, v is a linear growth rate for a nuclei, and uh, essentially dr over dt gives us the v and is a constant, and the t is a time t. And what you see from this one is as time goes towards infinity, the extended fraction goes towards infinity. Of course, this is not real, but that's why we call it extended. It's real plus the so-called phantom. Phantom is uh, those that are overlapped with existing ones. Okay. With that, we can put this f e x t into our top equation. We will have the real fraction for precipitate for real precipitate would be 1 minus exp minus 1 over 3 pi n v to the power 3 t to the power of 4 okay and now we have something that uh, is finite from this equation when t goes towards positive infinity which means the time gets longer and longer towards infinity this within the bracket we are going towards minus infinity and uh, exponential of minus infinity is zero if you remember and then one minus zero is one which means even when the time goes towards positive infinity which means you wait longer and longer and longer the fraction of real conversion cannot be higher than one the most it can be is one it's when this term is zero it's when t towards goes towards infinity okay this equation is the famous jma equation or so-called johnson mer avrami equation that relates the transformation time and the real fraction this already have taken care of the overlapping case and it turns goes towards a finite number okay very important equation after we taken we have taken care of the overlapping situation the phantom situation a nuclear try to form within a existing transformed volume okay so in general this equation can be written as something in a similar fashion f the real fractional conversion is one minus exp instead of this equation we have minus k t to the power of n the n factor 
typically it's in the range from one to four typically in the range of one to four and we will talk about that in greater detail later okay the exponent factor we're going to talk briefly here is that the, the exponent factor n depends on read to yourself geometry of the nuclei or precipitate whether it's sphere shaped or it's a 2d very uh, thin plate shaped or it's in one dimensional a needle shaped that would influence the n exponent in addition the mechanism of the phase transformation also impacts the n factor for example when does the nucleation happen whether it's all happening at the beginning or it's gradually or whether it's so-called diffusion control the, the transformation is slow controlled by the mass transport due to solid state diffusion or it's trans limited by the interface rearrangement right between the precipitate phase and the matrix phase all these factors would impact the exponent m factor and we will talk about uh, these using a few examples briefly uh, in later slides okay so again we wrote the generalized jma equation f the real fraction of conversion equals one minus exponent show term within the exponent is minus kt to the power of n and we said n can be in the range of one to four typically okay and it, with this equation we can rearrange and take natural log this is what we are going to have we put f towards the right one minus f and then exp term move towards the left and then we take natural log on both sides this is what we are going to have okay minus natural log of one minus f equals kt to the power of n n has the same meaning and uh, we can take natural log again because on the right side kt to the power of n is always um positive at the same time f is always smaller than one so what but greater than zero so one minus this f is always a small number from zero to one and the natural log of that number is always negative number but then we have another negative sign then the left side is also always positive so as a result we can take natural log again this is what we're going to have left side is natural log of minus natural log bracket one minus f the right side you separate natural log of k plus n exponent factor you put it in front of the natural log of time factor this is a another form to write the jma equation okay another form in natural log format of the same jma equation now let's take a look at an example of so-called conversion time or ct curve in this curve of course the vertical axis is the extent of conversion or fraction of conversion and the horizontal x would be time quite often given in log scale previously we mentioned it's going from extent of conversion from zero to one or from zero percent to a hundred percent and then different uh, temperature we would have different uh, curves okay when the time is short the extent of conversion is low and for a given temperature the longer the time the higher the extent of conversion and when time goes towards infinity the extent of conversion goes towards a hundred so this is what we have okay and with the data from f which is the vertical axis and the t horizontal axis we can plug those numbers into this equation and fit to get the factor of n and the law natural log how do you do that so here we plot the same thing natural log of we put the minus sign inside the natural log which is natural log one divided by natural log one over f one minus f that's our vertical axis horizontal axis is natural log of time 
if we are going to do this type of plotting for these of curves, each of the curve would give us what type of line? This versus natural log of t, because for each direction n is quite often a constant. As a result, we would get a straight line. A straight line. When you plot left side versus natural log of t, you would get a straight line, and the slope would be n. The slope for this curve would be n. And similarly, you can do the same thing for a different temperature. If for precipitation, quite often a lower temperature, okay, you get the, the plots at t2, also a straight line, because they share the same n, and the slope would give us the factor of n, and then the intercept would give us the natural log of k2. Okay, so these are the two kinetic plots that we got from the conversion time plots, from the CT plot. We get a series of straight lines, and as we mentioned, the slope of these straight lines, these parallel straight lines, give us the n factor. So, which means if you can get kinetic fraction versus time conversion versus time curve at different temperature by re processing the data, the slope of these curves would give you the exponent factor that tells you something fundamental about the reaction's um, geometry and the fundamental mechanism. Well, the slope of, well, the intercept of these straight lines with the vertical axis would give us the case when natural log of t is zero. That intercept give us the natural log of k1 and k2 for different temperature. And with the k1 and k2, in principle, we can get so-called reaction activation energy, which we will talk about briefly later. Okay?